Uh, I heard some names today that I would like to go back to. Like uh, earlier, there was Joe Washington. Now, Joe Washington was from up here at Lummi, married to a, a woman named Martha Washington, which no relation to that other Martha. <laughs> but um, he brought back at Maisel Bridges' request, he was on the uh, tribal council of the Pialop Indian tribe, which was then a chairwoman. Uh, at her request, Joe Washington and Martin Sampson, uh, also from here on the Salish Sea, brought back to the Pialops the first salmon ceremony. This is in the early 70s. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, so, in, in some ways, I mean, like uh, speaking of the Mi Michigan tribe, uh, in 1965, uh, a state court ruled that the Puyallup tribe did not exist, uh, that it was no longer, it was just a memory, no more than something like the Knights of Columbus or the Boy Scouts, some fraternal organization. You know, and uh, <coughs> that, that holding was overruled, but there was that space of time that uh, Puyallup tribe, like the Makoshu tribe, had to live through that space of court holding that they had ceased to exist as an Indian nation. So what do you do in that time? Well, uh, you keep on fighting. You know, right. And, uh, <clears throat> and uh, Joe Washington, brought that back to the Puyallup tribe. And yet it was a tradition of Puyallup tribe for centuries, you know. But it was missing for a while. And it needed the assistance of uh, the culture carriers among Indian people to help rehabilitate that memory and bring it back into the life and being of the Puyallup tribe. And same with uh, Vai Hilbert, who was mentioned. She was a specialist in uh, different of uh, the Salish languages, both on Puget Sound and on the coast, or Salish Sea. Uh, and uh, part of her work was uh, recording and translating uh, the stories and the memories of Willie Frank or Bill Frank Sr. Billy Frank's dad, and those continue to exist because of the work of Vi Helbert and her expertise in, in the, the Indian languages that most Indians of this area had ceased speaking. And yet there is a vibrant language program in most of uh, uh, Western Washington tribes uh, today uh, through, through the work of the, the different tribes. And, partly aided even by the uh, gaming income that has uh, come come to the, the tribes. I mean, Makachu ruled not to exist. They, they have one of them, uh, they're, they're probably the, one of the top uh, several job producers in King County today. They employ uh, more Indians and non-Indians than almost anybody else outside of Boeing, so <clears throat> and, uh, but they, they do exist, they've always existed, you know, despite what some white court at one point in time said. Uh, and uh, on Standing Rock, I mean, so, some of the most encouraging things to me is to hear by YouTube and uh, by the various uh, cyber space communications, the young voice of, uh, voices of Indian youth in their teens, in the young adults, speaking first on the 
the climate change movement, of, uh, the pre-Paris preparations to that, uh, you, you'd hear these, these uh, articulate, spiritual voices from Indian country, uh, almost across the nation, uh, speaking very uh, earnestly, knowledgeably, wisely on what are both the, the conditions uh, of the planet as well as why something has to be done about it. And they were there in Paris and then they were there in advance of, of Standing Rock of last July and August. They were there before the, uh, the lawsuits were filed. They were running across the country to, uh, <clears throat> to the Army Corps of Engineers in, uh, in uh, D.C., the headquarters. Uh, and then they spoke, they came to the, the camp, the Sacred Stone camp. They, they, they came. Uh, Together, but they, some of the most moving voices that you heard of the past uh, three, four, five years are these young Indian voices in their teens. You take the time to listen to them. Uh, if there was anything in in this that I would read, would be uh, uh, an article I wrote for the. Seattle PI uh, talking about uh, meeting with Senator Kennedy right after the sale of broken treaties. And Senator Kennedy, Edward Kennedy, uh, saying, you know, the, the problem we have, you know, in Congress is we don't really know who speaks for Indians now. Uh, and if Indians could, you know, come to us and speak, with one voice, then we would have a better feel of what we should, what we could do. Not necessarily what we should do, but what we could do. And and I told him uh, that, you know, Senator, your profession is based upon a division of, a, of, of opinion. You, know, you don't say uh, all white Americans come speak with one voice, you divide yourselves into Republicans and Democrats. You know. And really what, what you have to go to is the merit of the, of the proposition. You know. uh, and not expect or demand something that uh, has never been and never will be. You know. uh, and uh, but toward the end of uh, that I had uh, uh, said uh, tribes like the Quinault, Puyallup, and Colville, uh, well, go, go above that. Fortunately, many tribes have rejected the sterile conditioning of uniform controlled political thoughts and have reverted to their former standards <coughs> of self government. Tribes like the Quinault, Puyallup, and Colville have recognized again that official position is but an instrument of service to their Indian communities. They do not fear new ideas and creative thought evolving among their own members, but invite their contribution to the good of the people. Their governments have set, sent their elderly and their young students to Washington, D.C. without reluctance of saying, they speak for us and Indian aspirations. They are proud to invite others into their school programs for their youngest Indian children and don't want anyone to deny that they represent Indian people. And, uh, and so I'm, I'm saying, listen to all those voices. You know. Draw forth what is valued in them draw forth from the, the spiritual content that most of them carry. And uh, and another uh, 
name, Clyde Boyer. You know, in 1963, I met both uh, Vine Deloy and Clyde Boyer. In, in well, Clyde first in Utah, but uh, Vine in Denver, and then uh, within two years, I and Vine were riding across the country from Denver to Washington, D.C. for him to become executive director of NCAI and I to be his research assistant. And so there was, you know, in his car uh, going through the country but stopping back to some of the places of his earlier life, uh, the Tri-Cities, uh, Rock Island, uh, I, three, <laughs> the Tri Cities there, uh, where he went to uh, school, and he had graduated there from a seminary uh, before joining United Scholarship Service in Denver with Tilly Walker uh, of three affiliated tribes in North Dakota. But anyhow, uh, those days of traveling together in the car uh, bonded Ein Vine pretty much for, forever. Uh, in August of 1964, on about the fifth or sixth time with Clyde Warrior from uh, Ponca City uh, and White Eagle, had traveled from Olympia to Niobe on the Macaw Reservation for the uh, annual conference, uh, annual convention, conference of National Indian Youth Council, but it was just I and Clyde. And uh, he had, we'd been together for a few days in Olympia, uh, and uh, then we drove together uh, from Olympia to Niobe, which is in the, those days was about a five hour trip. And Clyde started singing at the beginning of that, and he sang all the way to Niobe, five hours, you know, and uh, a number, a good number of songs, you know. And earlier he had told the National Indian Youth Council, you know, that uh, the one of the really disturbing uh, aspect that he found in his life is that for almost uh, at least a generation or more that the most of the Indian people of Oklahoma were not creating new songs that they were just holding on to what had been uh, come before and held as personal family songs and whatever but uh, there, there was this di disappearing of new songs and new music, and he was intent, you know, to hold on to as much of that as he could, but was really concerned that there wasn't the creativity and the basis for creating new songs. In one of my judgments, you know, one of the the greatest attribute or greatest contributions to the American Indian movement is the AIM song. And that has uh, really uh, spread broadly among uh, Indians, at least from the Arctic to uh, the Mexican border. I don't know, I haven't gone south of there. But the AIM song has uh, become almost universally between the the American, Canadian, Alaskan Native people. And uh, <clears throat> so, uh, and, and I've said something about, uh, to the effect of characterizing uh, Clyde is that, you know, that he found his life in the singing and in the songs. And, uh, <clears throat> but, uh, and then just, uh, uh, going back again to 64, after uh, when we were first planning to join uh, the
the National Indian Youth Council with the Indian Treaty Fishing Rise. Uh, we had met in Denver, Colorado after Christmas and through New Year's and uh, had chosen to, to come to the Northwest as opposed to taking the new Youth Council to join in the tail end of the fight against Kinsua Dam. In Pennsylvania and New York, uh, with uh, Clinton Rickard and Mad Bear Anderson and others, but we came to the fishing rise, and we came here because there were already uh, committed resistance. There was the defense on the Nisqually River. There was the defense on the Puyallup River. There was, uh, and led by oh, what's your name? Um, uh, uh, at, there was a woman, 65-year woman, chairwoman of Muckleshoot at that time, uh, and um, <clears throat> and she said, if we have to, we'll fill the jails of King County to defend our, our right. Um, <clears throat> and uh, the majority of the Muckleshoot Council at that time were, were women. And the Aquilius, they were declaring their intent to fight and, and go to jail. And so the, the Youth Council wasn't coming to create something or begin something. They wanted to lend their support uh, and strengthen the defenses that were already occurring in, in behalf of treaty rights and Indian people and fishing. Uh, but in, after that meeting in Denver, I traveled down to Oklahoma uh, with uh, Clyde Warrior and Bill Pensnow from Ponca, Catherine Redcorn and Osage, and uh, we're in station wagon, and you know we we're packed from one end to the other. And, but I went down. Uh, uh, first to uh, see what Oklahoma was like, and particularly uh, Clyde and Bill Pensano's family. But I, w I went down there also because uh, Quinault Indians, as other Indians from Washington State, in the 50s, Western Washington Indians, who, whose families and uh, grandparents and, and parents had gone to Chamawa, were closed out of Chamawa in the 50s. And Chamawa was closed to uh, the populations that had previously served from Washington to Montana, and was now accepting or educating only Navajos and Alaska Natives. And so they were bringing at these great distances, <coughs> Alaska Natives to Jamala and Navajos from Arizona and New Mexico. And so uh, Western Washington Indians found an eligibility in uh, perhaps the, the fall of 63 to uh, send uh, students to the Indian schools in Oklahoma. So I was going down there to uh, visit Quinault students in four uh, boarding schools or Indian schools uh, in Oklahoma. And so I hitchhiked ar around uh, from Chilaco near Ponca City to uh, uh, Anadarko Concho at El Reno, and then Fort Sill at uh, Fort Lawton, or Lawton, not Fort Lawton, <laughs> Lawton. <laughs> Oklahoma, and then I, I went over to another, to the family of one of the persons who had come back uh, in that station wagon, that was Fran Pofabitti, um at India Homa, where um, now her, her father, Frank Pofabitti, was somewhat famous for winning uh, an oil case on taxation and uh, tax immunities, uh, and it was Chap uh, Pope Biddy versus uh, some oil company name, and uh, 
but there I, I were in Frank Pofabitti's father-in-law was a guy named Otis Tapabitti, who at that time was the oldest living Comanche. And um, so, and Frank had his house there, and he had some oil income, so I mean, it wasn't a shack, but it wasn't a mansion or anything elaborate that he lived in. But right next to him, in a house that refused electricity and refused uh, uh, electric lights, was his father-in-law, uh, Otis Chapabitti, who just didn't want you know these things like electricity and wouldn't have them in his house. So he had his his wood pile and he had his uh, kerosene lamps or whatever. Uh, Lamps and uh, <clears throat> but he he talked to me about you know uh, one the hopes that he he placed in the youth, but also wished that the youth of the Comanche Nation, and Kiowa, and some of the other places around there would uh, some of the other nations around there would restored to their lives and then he was telling me about you know that just the disciplines and, uh, that that he'd gone through as a young boy and you know pr primarily just if, like running the maces just to make certain that you were physically strong and kept your your body uh, right and uh, like uh, and go through the ceremonies so keep your body pure and your mind uh, pure. But, uh, <laughs> but anyhow, just <laughs> sitting next to a Comanche, and I've been, I've had LaDonna Harris on the other side. <laughs> but, uh, and uh, is, uh, you know, bring facts on it. The, the one thing I regret with those Chapavity is that, uh, that had he lived longer than he did, I would have been able to, uh, at some point, give him the one <laughs> prized uh, gift that I promised him, which was blueback salmon mm -hmm. from Quinault, uh, that uh, had not been able to deliver that uh, to him. And uh, I always regretted that. But but uh, <laughs> he was interested in salmon. And, uh, and then just a few years be be beyond that is uh, you have, uh, <clears throat> during the Poor People's Campaign, and uh, Clyde was declining at that point and uh, uh, died <coughs> in uh, uh, July, I think, of 68 right after uh, the Poor People's Campaign. But his uh, mother-in-law, uh, Della Warrior's mother, her name was uh, Katie Bird, she, she could have been elected mayor of Resurrection City in uh, D.C. She was so popular among, uh, she was the most popular person among the black population in Resurrection City. Some of the lesser popular ones were the the uh, fighting Jesse Jackson <laughs> and uh, and uh, oh, what's his name Williams, uh, who fought to be mayor. They contested each other, but Katie Bird was beloved by the Puerto Ricans, the whites, the blacks, the Chicanos, and uh, and they were all willing to be runners for her nightly <laughs> nightly bootleggers <laughs> produce up on uh, 14th and New Street <laughs> and, and she didn't have to pay for it <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> but uh, the, an aspect of that is during the poor people's campaign is on May 28, 1968, the U.S. Supreme Court 
issued a decision in the case of <coughs> Department uh, Puyallup Tribe versus Department of Game of Washington. <coughs> and uh, it involved, it was companion to a, another case uh, called Cows versus, uh, State versus Cows, and involving the Nisqually River. Uh, and the decision went against the tribes, and it pretty much uh, put put the state of Washington under <laughs> control for regulating <coughs> uh, tribal fisheries, at least off reservation fisheries. But there are two you you had where you had uh, the <coughs> the um, the judge ruling Cochran, his name was Judge Cochran, ruling that the that uh, the Puyallup tribe failed, ceased to exist and were only a memory, but they did recognize that there remained a uh, Puyallup Indian reservation of approximately 30 acres, uh, which was the Puyallup Cemetery. And there was at least one road, if not a railroad, between that recognized reservation, that cemetery, and the Gallup River. So there was no way of fishing on that reservation because there was no water. There were only graves on that reservation. But, uh, but we were in D.C. for the Poor People's Campaign, and we immediately uh, decided that we were going to have an unannounced protest at the U.S. Supreme Court. And we went to uh, the Chicano representatives, Corky Gonzalez, uh, Crusade for Justice in Denver, and, uh, and uh, Reyes Tiarina of the Alianza from New Mexico, uh, and uh, also consulted with uh, Ralph Abernathy, Dr. Martin Luther King's successor, and said uh, we knew they already had planned demonstrations at the Agriculture Department or in the uh, at one of the Senate offices buildings, but if they wanted to, they could join us at the U.S. Supreme Court. Now, at that time, no one had uh, challenged the regulations that made it uh, almost impossible to have a demonstration there. Uh, the New York Times, in their coverage of it, cited the federal statutes that we were violating by demonstrating there. But the, the point I want to make is that when we went there, you know, we, we went along the same trail that Abernathy and Jesse Jacksons were going uh, to the Senate office buildings, and we were right behind them. And up there on the uh, Supreme Court, uh, at the top of the steps, and this is the long steps, uh, court personnel were standing up there uh, watching the parades go by. You know. And then when, when it came to the Indians and Chicanos, then we stopped and <laughs> started heading up the stairs. <laughs> and the court personnel, they start screaming. <laughs> and they ran inside and they locked the doors. <laughs> and the thing was that uh, one of our largest contingents were elders uh, and some young people, but mainly elders from Fort uh, Berthold, the three affiliated tribes. And uh, so uh, first you had rose crows fly as high and beating on these big bronze doors, you know, saying, you know, uh, we want justice, we want justice, you know, and, uh, and they kept the doors locked. Uh, but you had the pictures of all these elders 
uh, three affiliated tribes. Now they're just uh, upstream from Standing Rock, you know. But there's this phalanx of uh, Mandan, Hadassah, and Arikara women, you know, just seated, sitting down across the doorways of the U.S. Supreme Court. Yeah. And I, I remember that when in August and September of this past year, the Northwest Indians took canoes to just a little, to the, to the, the Missouri River, you know, just downstream from that. But those Missouri River people, and I was born on banks of Missouri, uh, were there for Northwest tribes, the Stevens Treaty tribes, in 1968, and the Northwest Treaty tribes were there for Standing Rock and the Missouri River and the Water is Life in 2016 and you know and these are connections that you know, <laughs> I form in my mind um, and they're important uh, to me and I think to Indian people uh, general, generally but uh, we were able to go in and uh, with two of the defendants in the Nisqually case uh, Al Bridges and Curly Johns, Herman Johns Jr. and address the U.S. Supreme Court in the absence of the justices. <laughs> it was, but we were able to make statements, and uh, and we did take the opportunity when they let a delegation in, you know, as condition for us ending our demonstration. <laughs> um, we we took the opportunity to address that court. And uh, in his biography by Juan Williams, uh, Thurgood Marshall, in about 1994, 1995, somewhere, 1996, whenever that was published, was still remembering that demonstration <laughs> and speaking against about it. You know, I. And this is what almost 30, uh, close to 30 years later, he's remembering that. And saying, you know, I support, you know, the First Amendment, the right to petition and uh, speak. But those Indians, I, I don't believe you have a right to violate the law to do it. <laughs> so, uh, you know, it, it was. Uh, and, and you know, it also laid the way in part for, uh, I mean, Ralph Johnson, uh, uh, a law professor from University of Washington, he quickly wrote a, a law article called Error in the Supreme Court or something and, and wrote how the Supreme Court had got that wrong. But, but also the Piala case went back to the Supreme Court uh, two more times and called the Puyallup Trilogy and uh, the same justices ended up saying uh, this case should never have been in the state courts in the first place because the Puyallups have sovereign immunity and should not have been uh, subject to this lawsuit. You know. And it became a a major uh, sovereign immunity case used uh, across the country after 1977. Uh, but more or less a complete abandonment of that decision, that first Puyallup decision that we uh, had protested then and that was uh, pretty much uh, put into another, totally different framework by the Bolt decision, which the U.S. Supreme Court uh, then upheld in uh, July of, of uh, 
1979. Now, uh, quickly, if I go back to the consul consultation uh, issue, I went more to so I went more to songs than to <laughs> and then to colonialism. But, uh, <laughs> But, but uh, that, that, that was one area where, other than the prohibitions against uh, Indian religious practices, ceremonies, and even songs. Uh, well, one other name I want to go back to is, uh, you know, and my, my, my own youth, is uh, Joe, Hale Joe Hilaire, another Lummi who uh, was one of my teachers, uh, starting when I'd be 13, 14, and uh, probably along with uh, Hannah Bochup, uh, granddaughter of Chief Tehola Quinals, but who was living in Niabe on the Macaw Reservation, were strong influences on me earlier, but uh, Joe, uh, gained his world renown uh, when he was at the 1961-62 World's Fair in Seattle, uh, which uh, now that's 50, 60, 55 years ago or so, but uh, he, but before that, you know, I spent my first time with Joe Hilaire scooting up uh, me on my knees and my knee pads, and Joe on his rump scooting down strawberry uh, 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 rows, you know, picking strawberries. Um, and I mean, he was famous among Indian tribes here in the Western Washington, but he didn't yet have his great uh, public acclaim uh, in the white news media or world news media. Uh, and so, you know, we'd be talking and, uh, and he, he was already elder. He, I think he died about 1967, but he, he moved down the road scooting Moving on his round, I'd be on my knees <laughs> picking the berries. And, but his wife, which was his second wife, Nina Hilaire, uh, I think she, he may have been her seventh husband. <laughs> but uh, she was straw boss, so she was in charge of, of everyone on the, in the fields. Uh, and that included a lot of. Uh, British Columbia Indians who were trucked down, <laughs> came in these big trucks on the back with their belongings, uh, which is uh, something that started occurring as soon as there were automobiles, is the, the trucks started moving uh, the different villages to the hop fields, to the berry fields. And, Pretty much they'd take all their belongings and flour sacks or gunny sacks or whatever, uh, and they'd go off for the, the summer and the long seasons. But, but Joe uh, Hilaire, who's a master carver, uh, a great storyteller, uh, and told me uh, and us at the berry fields, you know, some of the lummy uh, stories. Then I had occasion to, later to have him work with the youth of Teola on the Quinault Reservation when he was going to do a model of one man small canoe uh, and, uh, and telling the kids just how spiritually, how every aspect of that canoe, how spiritual every aspect of that canoe building was, and it wasn't with a power saw, it was with uh, the smaller tools, hand tools, uh, and, uh, and how there was this history carried, uh, memory carried in each 
piece of wood that came off that massive, once massive tree, you know, and uh, and how the spirit transferred, even you know, transferred, you know, uh, from that original tree to that fallen tree to that making, and you know, even went to you, um, and there was. You know, a, a history and a shared history. You know, uh, that tree. You know, you do a great part of your personal history from that great tr tr tree, who m may have carried a history and a memory of already a few centuries. You know, so. And water is the same way. Water carries memory. Water is alive. It's not just life, it's a vibe. And, um, and, you know, water carries those canoes. Uh, 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 those waters beginning up on Tacoma or Mount Rainier, they, they carry memories, they carry canoes, they carry people, they carry lives. Uh, and, uh, but, now, so what, how do we protect uh, what is uh, spiritual? Is it with lawsuits? All right. we, we have in um, the lawsuit filed the Standing Rock, you have, uh, no, where? <laughs> uh, where's the one that has this? Yeah, uh, <clears throat> you, you have there, uh, and this is where I started the consultation. Uh, what was the name of my talk? <laughs> no, I haven't got to yet. <laughs> uh, consultation, colonialism's last perfect pitch for oppression. Well, uh, you know, the, the, there was two decisions by Judge Bosberg in that lawsuit. The first one uh, <clears throat> came to a, a, a point of, uh, well, indicated that it, the, the one, the tribes have an act Ask for protection against any possible oil spills. That's not the, the issue before this court. The issue before this court uh, seeking restraining order is that the, the, the Army Corps and uh, the corporation have uh, failed in their uh, obligations to provide uh, consultation or to consult with the tribes under various statutes. Going back to the historic uh, places, Preservation Act of 65 is amended, uh, and going through several federal statutes and with some mention of the American Indian <coughs> Uh, Religious Freedom Act and the Religious Freedom Res Restoration Act, but it's a 56-page de decision, and a good part of it is a record of how many times the Army Corps and the uh, uh, DAPL, Dakota Access Pipeline, has contacted the Standing, Root, uh, Standing Rock Tribe to uh, carry out these consultation uh, activities, these activities of identifying sacred sites uh, and uh, pointing out what what is there to, to be disturbed or not to be disturbed. But anyhow, it's, and it goes through uh, 50 to 80 instances of failures of the Standing Rock Tribe to respond to consultations or guidance requests, you know. 
And the, the problem there is every time that the tribe might have, had the tribe responded uh, in every instance, uh, instantly, it would have only speeded the process for that pipeline to cross that river. Uh, because, you know, as in the second or later decision, uh, when, he, when he points out that, you know, the, uh, the DAPL was very accommodating. It even modified the routes, you know, uh, when, when there was something sacred identified. But, uh, the and then you had the, the the federal the other part of the government the federal government in addition to the army corps you know uh, they they uh, said uh, okay uh, when they starting in. Uh, when, when they first said, well, will you make a voluntary stop of moving the pipeline? Uh, <clears throat> that uh, there's still some questions. And then on December 4th, when they said they would not grant an easement to cross the lake at the proposed location uh, based on the current record, now, in that, their uh, statement, in their series of statements, which is uh, not the Army Corps, but the Assistant Army Secretary, uh, plus Attorney General Lynch and Secretary of Interior uh, Jewell, uh, no one, you can't find in any of their statements, you know, the ones who were the good guys in the federal government, you can find no use of the words sacred, religious, religion, spiritual, spirituality, cultural, or culturally, nor worship in any form. Uh, and uh, there is the use of the words historic tribal homelands, potentially affected waters, and treaty hunting and fishing rights. Uh, those are mentioned, but they're followed by this, this statement, which is made in essentially all of their uh, hold off decisions and their final, uh, we won't grant the easement statement of December 4th. They say the assistant secretary of the department, this. Department of the Army's Assistant Secretary says again, I want to be clear that this decision does not alter the Army's position that the Corps' prior reviews and actions have comported with legal requirements. In other words, they did everything they were supposed to do on consultation. It had only been the tribe's failure. but. Uh, and then in issuing his decisions of, of uh, February uh, <clears throat> uh, and beyond, Judge Boesberg uh, just al also reaffirmed that, you know, the government has done everything that the law required them to do, you know, under consultation. And, uh, which was the, the claim that the, 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 the lawyers carried in. They didn't carry in a, a, uh, an issue of, of pipeline leakage. They carried in the, the issue of, you know, this government has failed to consult with us. You know. But then, uh, as I say, if they had com uh, answered immediately, it would have only speeded the process. And then... Uh, <clears throat> <clears throat> and then relying on on these uh, issues of uh, 
of consent. Uh, you have the tribes uh, until January of this year, and NCAI and related groups issued a statement that you know uh, we're, we're from this point forward we're going to demand consent and not just rely upon consultation. But that comes late. But you have uh, in each of the you know celebrated executive orders from the Clinton administration through George Bush through Obama. You have in each of those executive orders a uh, savings uh, statement that nothing in this ex order uh, creates any enforceable rights. You know? And so you have that, sta that uh, carrying through uh, the executive orders on government to government relations, you have it in the executive order on consultation with uh, Indian tribes, you have it in sacred sites, executive order. And then uh, you come down to uh, not an executive order from uh, President Obama, but you have a 2010 uh, <clears throat> memorandum that uh, follows on to the uh, acceptance by the United States uh, of the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of the Indigenous, of Indigenous Peoples. You have in there, you have Article 31 uh, that indicates uh, that uh, before there is uh, disturbance or in certain actions affecting Indian nations requires their consent. Okay. And, and uh, in uh, that, you have uh, that memorandum which the United States, Canada, and uh, maybe Australia voted against the declaration in 2007 when it was adopted by the United Nations and subsequently like in 2010 with the Obama memorandum then you have uh, we accept this the, the United States is bound by sees itself bound or uh, required to comply with the the Declaration of Human Rights, um, of Rights of Indigenous People. Uh, but you have in that memorandum that uh, the United States regards the, the, the term uh, consent uh, to mean meaningful consultation and not necessarily agreement with the tribes. And so you have a non-acceptance of, of that uh, consent provision. Uh, and uh, uh, at, at some time, I'll, uh, you'll be free to read what I have to say about the history of consent in all these laws affecting Indians. But I've gone way, way beyond. <laughs> Uh, my my time, but you have you know again, even this year. Then you have uh, the Pope uh, saying you know, uh, indigenous indigenous people must be given consent under the Article Thirty One of the. But but this is more than you know the United States did. The United States has really said, we still won't go with consent. And, and in Standing Rock's uh, own, uh, own claim, which is sort of an international standard, is uh, they said one of their uses of consent in their lawsuit was we don't consent uh, to be sued, we do do not consent to any waiver of our, our sovereignty to be sued by anybody else. But that's one of the problems of the international law, is that you can't 
take the United States into certain international forums or courts without their consent, you know. And we can play it down to these lower levels for ourselves, but then uh, it's more difficult to say that uh, that you can't recognize that principle for the United States in the Hague or in the Organization of American States. If you're saying that that's a, the one doctrine that protects us is uh, sovereign immunity and no no non-consent to do not cons consent to waiver, then. Uh, it's more difficult to say that it should become compulsory that you can uh, act to protect through judicial measures uh, in almost in different uh, courts and forums. I, I will just, uh, you know, the first uh, Sioux Treaty with the United States was 1805, and in that there is a grant to the United States a full power and sovereignty over uh, uh, an 18 by 40, 18 mile by 40 mile tract uh, on the Mississippi R River, just downstream from what's today St. Paul, St. Paul, Minneapolis. It's a grant of full power and sovereignty from the tribes to the United States, you know, which is one of the stronger constructions of reserved rights and a grant of, of rights to the United States from the base of rights already held by the Indian nations. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, uh, to, to me that's material to uh, what are the treaty rights of the Sioux on the, the Missouri, and particularly under the 1851 uh, Treaty of Laramie, where, uh, you know, it, it starts out uh, saying that, uh, you know, one, it creates, not creates, but reserves the great Sioux nation without prejudice in claims to any other uh, rights outside the Great Sioux Reservation, which is massive uh, already without the unceded territories. And uh, then it also uh, starts out with uh, the United States themselves, meaning all numbered states, bind themselves to protect the Indian nations from any depredations by citizens of the United States. And, um, but there were really no uh, 1851 treaty rights asserted by Standing Rock or even by uh, Cyan River or by uh, Pine Ridge and uh, Rosebud and Lord Brule in the four different lawsuits filed, and uh, but there are, there are things in that 1851 to treaty. Uh, but oh, and the the other thing on the second Boasberg decision was uh, a reading of Indian religious rights under those line of statutes, plus the American Indian. Uh, Religious Freedom Act and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. <laughs> and what you find is that none of these court decisions decided on Indian religious claims that went in the Indians' favor. Not one of them, only one. And that's under a separate statute. And that's relating to incarcerated persons, not necessarily Indians. Uh, but an Indian protected in cutting his hair under this, uh, the same federal statute to protect protected uh, others in wearing their, uh, to, I, I don't know what you call them, but uh, the six and uh, some Muslims in certain, uh, and Jewish persons in diets, you know, 
and that's a, uh, a general, it's the incarcerated person, but that's the only court case that's went in Indians' favor under all this, these lawsuits since the, the American Indian Religious Freedom Act, you know, and pretty much what they, they've created is the Bible is a decision made in 1988 called Lane versus uh, an Indian Cemetery Protections uh, Group. And, uh, but the reason I say that is that there was a Sioux <coughs> lawsuit, Rosebud Sioux lawsuit in 1908 was on religious rights. And uh, <coughs> uh, it, and, and this will end it. Is <laughs> 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 uh, uh, oh, okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but it is where uh, it's called. Uh, Quick Bear versus Lep, uh, and there Rosebud uh, Sue filed suit against the United States to uh, discontinue and bar the use of treaty funds, Sioux treaty funds and Sioux tribal funds uh, to pay the Catholic Church to school Indian children in South Dakota, and uh, there's two lines in it, that, uh, which are basically the, the Sioux lost that, you know, and it, it said because this is not a violation, well the Sioux claimed it was a violation of the First Amendment, the Establishment uh, Clause, uh, barring the creation or support of any religion. And the Supreme Court said, well, no, because these, these aren't public funds, these are tribal funds. And uh, to, uh, <clears throat> to bar the use of these funds for Catholic education or paying the Catholics, would be a denial of freedom of worship to the Indians, you know. And uh, that may be the last decision that re in the Supreme Court that really supported Indian religious freedom, but it wasn't indigenous uh, religious freedom. And, and then they went beyond that and said, uh, in this uh, statement of good trust law that uh, the, the, the holder, the, well, uh, the beneficiary cannot be denied by uh, implied power. It's a great phrase, and I can't find it here. <laughs> you printed it out. I know you did. <laughs> but uh, so anyhow, I'll, I'll I'll end on that. But I give me just half a second. <laughs> and uh, that is not it. That's not it. That's This should be it. <laughs> okay, here. here's how I wrote it out. <laughs> uh, let's see, prohibiting, oh, in fact, the national history had become one of overt <coughs> suppression and near absolute prohibition of Indian religions, rituals, and expression of beliefs. Prohibiting regulations were issued and enforcements range from withholding of rations and goods obligated under treaty provisions to the use of deadly military campaigns, force, and killings. 
Failing to provide these Indian monies to the Catholic Church, the court reasoned, nonetheless, quote, would be to prohibit the free exercise of religion amongst the Indians, unquote. That statement was followed by an off unobserved gold standard in trust doctrine. Quote, the, <laughs> how do you say it, pronounce it? Uh, Gabe, <laughs> C-E-S-T-U-I-S, <laughs> uh, trust and T, meaning the beneficiaries cannot be deprived of their rights by the trustee of the United States in the exercise of power implied. In other words, the, the U.S. should not either by implication or directly be able to deny the trustee of their rights, which is exactly what they were doing there. <laughs> okay, that, that, that is it.